Good morning, everyone. We'll um, try and get some time at the end for questions. Um, and uh, I think really what we want to do is just make a few key uh, headlines in terms of um, how you build a well-being program. And then Zoe's going to talk from a personal experience of working with many clients and as uh, what's really happened on the ground. So a bit of theory, a bit of practice. So thinking about the population we have of employees, and some nice resonance from previous talks we've already heard today, really three things we need to think about in terms of what are we doing for our young people, what are we doing for our older people, and what are we doing as they go on that journey between young and old. Um, we have something that we've developed called the Mind Health Index, um, based off uh, 200 scientific papers. From that, we've defined these various states from struggling, languishing, getting by, and flourishing. And we clearly see that the older they are, the wiser you are, the more likely you are to flourish. But converse of that, the younger you are, you're more likely to be struggling and languishing. And there's a need to give more mental health support. Uh, but also, as we get older, uh, things start to wear out, sadly. Um, our risks start to go up. We need more physical health. So a well-being program does need to bring physical and mental health together while addressing those life stages in between. So looking specifically at uh, younger people. So there's too much focus purely on the actual mental issues. We don't look at what happens before, okay? We, we, it's a very reactive space. We're looking at anxiety, we're looking at depression. We need to tackle those things. We wouldn't be better if we can actually deal with it beforehand. We've identified 10 good mind health skills. And actually, for young people, we've identified these six in particular. And we, if, the more we can develop these skills in our young people, the more likely they are to flourish, and also the more likely they are to be in flow. And in flow is a sort of personal experience of productivity. So if we can support our people to develop these skills, 2.6 times more likely to flourish was over twice as likely to be in flow. It's a fantastic win-win for you as an employer, for our employees as individuals. Uh, the life stages talked about, there's challenges, thinking about, you know, we constantly meet new challenges being a parent or uh, going through the menopause. There are new skills we need to learn, physical experiences we need to, to manage. These are going to impact in people. How can we support them through that? There's a huge impact in terms of kind of issues, uh, in terms of days lost, in terms of the experience, which... You know, people don't feel supported, managers don't understand. There's been a huge uh, boon, this kind of um, support there for employees in the workplace. And uh, it has a really material impact on quality of life and quality of work. Once we, again, we're back to this sort of flourishing and in-flow logic. And we do have an aging workforce. As we get older, we do accrue these physical risks, be it cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and lifestyle does drive a lot of cancer risk. Um, we actually see, from the age of 55 onwards, the actual risk in the, in the population starts dropping. Not, I'm afraid, because mag people magically change their lifestyle. It's more they're vanishing from the data. We're losing them from the workforce and that's 12 years before they're due to retire. So we've got to think about how we could support the physical health of our colleagues. BITC, um, I sit on the, uh, the wellbeing board for BITC. We've just published a paper looking at the economic value proposition, and it's massive out there. Okay. <clears throat> Estimate from McKinsey was between 130, 370 billion. Our estimate was about 180, 200 billion. Basically, a fraction of a percentage of that is hugely uh, transformational in terms of the economy. So 
is not enough simply to provide assessments to people, to tell them the situation they're in, they're going to need support. This is going to be about behavior change, it's going to be about health coaching. So the kind of things we're seeing people adopt at the moment are greater programs in terms of these life stage uh, challenges, in terms of um, fertility, menopause, a um, great deal on uh, gender identity, and also uh, I'm really pleased to see a greater focus on uh, metabolic disease, so diabetes, it's closely associated with cardiovascular disease, and the wonderful thing is that it is really about a common set of good behaviors that we can support people to develop to address these kinds of issues. So I've given you a sort of quick hit on the data. Now I want to bring this down to earth and a bit of reality. I'm going to hand over to Zoe just to talk about your experiences. There you go, Zoe. Thank you, Chris. Morning, everybody. So it's my privilege today to talk about what's been put into practice, and I can probably imagine you're all feeling very much like I'm feeling, that there has been so much data, so much information already from the three speakers before me about what is possible. I've been working in health and well-being for over 20 years, and when I started, there were no suppliers, there were no people to help you. You kind of went into businesses, there were uh, private medical in, um, insurers, there was EAPs, but the suppliers have come since, and that's great news. And with the suppliers have also come a, a huge amount of data. And that data is what I regret not having back in the day, because when we started, we were all a little bit pink and fluffy, and people said, what is this well-being you've added on to health? What are you talking about? And we've had to navigate that. And our job today in this session is to try and work out what we need to do to prevent um, challenges for the future. And my, my, my suggestion is we need to look and learn from the past, as we so often have. I regret not taking better data when I was doing some of the programs when we were starting off and just actually just trialing things. But you know what? An awful lot of those things work. So Matt in his, in his presentation just a minute ago said, know your demographics. And to me, if you don't think of anything else as you leave this room today, know your demographics. There are some amazing trends which are really popular. And they'll work, as Chris says, for some of your life, life uh, stages that you've got within your workforce. But each and every one of us in this room works for a different organization with a different demographic. And we'd be wrong to try and walk away saying, we can give you the answers. What I would say is you've probably already got the answers, but you've got to go looking for them. So I think we need to take a holistic approach to all life stages. And as I say, you've got to look within your, your information. The information can come from different places now. Everybody has different amounts of data coming. You can be overloaded from it. But just be really clear, as Matt said, know what your goals are, what you want to achieve. Bruce was talking earlier about if people actually join, um, have a friend at work and join socially, he said that we were twice as likely to survive another year of our life if we actually had a friend. So maybe our f first strategy should be get everyone to have a friend and go on a social event at your workplace, because that actually... In, after the pandemic has become through the data very loud and clear that it's actually something that people are really looking for. So know what you need to do. Last week I, was, um, I joined a, a call um, around uh, men's health. It was really, really interesting. There was a great example of, of that on there. Sometimes we look at the big wins and we, we look at what we think we want rather than actually looking at our data and seeing. And this particular organization who I know are in this room today actually looked at, at what they needed for their staff and what they really needed to look after was their men's health. It wasn't because they weren't doing all the other things. They'd already put that into place and it was going really well. They'd had a huge um, part around women's health. They've had lots of support, but actually had a lot of men. And when they looked at their data and their surveys, they found that they, these people were not being supported in the same way. They put in some talks really simple lunchtime talks that they could see were working really well in other areas and they put in in and they had so few people turn up to the first one but instead of stopping and thinking well obviously nobody really wants it they actually put another one in and a few more people went and what was the really interesting thing was they followed their data through and they followed their, their data through to see that after those few people came did they follow to go to the suppliers the pathways that they should do for those people to get health in time, they will be able to track that back. So when they look at what is being um, regarded as a healthcare issue, maybe for, for what people are needing to have treatment for, they will start to see the numbers coming down. 
So what I suggest is that we really need to look at the different life stages, put the, put the um, support in place, know what is needed, but follow it through, have that goal to know, because we do have that data to follow through to see uh, in which direction and whether that has been effective or not. So the other thing that I've um, found really interesting over the 20 years is having said that there is a lot of data, people are sometimes not good at using their own data. And in all the programs that I've ever done, if people believe it's your, the data from that organization, it is twice as powerful. That's a made-up stat. But it is really, really, um, really, really compelling. If you go, I've been to distribution sites at Pepsi, and said, this is your health data. 92% of you ha have a um, uh, body fat index which is above what it should be. We need to do something about this for you guys. And we put in programs that actually help that, them to do that. And that was really, really compelling. People knew that we were actually talking about them, not a national system statistic that they were part of. It was part of what we were doing for them at that moment. And the programs we put in were really sustainable and really new. Who knew that you could actually put a, a pedometer, not a pedometer, a psychometer in, in, a, in a lorry? So we knew that the Pepsi drivers were actually sat waiting to unload the Walker's Crest products in uh, distribution sites. They couldn't get out of the lorries because health and safety didn't allow it. But we were able to put things into the lorry so they could actually exercise when they wanted to. We suggested they looked in their lunchbox as to what they were actually taking with them. Because when you got to site, there was only choice of what was probably in the back of the truck, and that was just crisps, which are not a bad thing, but probably in moderation. So you really need to put into place what was going to help people in that moment. So when you have learnt, as I said, the organisation earlier, learnt that by putting in simple things like lunchtime talks, and I, back in the day, we used to have to do them ourselves. We are all so lucky. We can find an expert. Our suppliers are only too willing to say, I can give you an expert on that. I can give you an expert on that. There are so many people now able to support your programs. You can talk to your PMI providers, you can talk to EAP providers that are able to come in and give expertise at whatever subject you want. And then you can start to drive um, some real initiatives from that. And that's what I really um, encourage people to do. You need to bring the program to life. It has been a real challenge um, with the pandemic, with everybody working away. But as Bruce said, we all like social interactions. So don't throw away old-fashioned things about bringing people together. Be brave. If people say, we need to get people into the office, put your hand up and say, why don't we do something about health and well-being? I have been astounded at how few people actually do simple health assessments. I did a survey for ATSA back last year of 30 big organizations about lots of things they were doing all connected with health and well-being, and I may have spoken to some of you. I was astounded at how few, few people did simple health assessments. It's been incredibly... Um, uh, to me, that people actually still prefer a face-to-face. -face. We all thought that when we offered face-to-face -face, face health assessments back before digital was so easy, that actually people said, oh, I haven't got time, I'm not coming into the office for that. If you look at the um, stats since then, actually people really like to have that interaction, a one-to-one -one interaction with someone that's going to take notice of them in that moment and talk to them about their health issues. We talk about well-being a lot. I still like to add on the word health. I remind everybody else to remember the word health. When I started, that is what we did. We looked a lot about health and your well-being. So I think that's a really important thing. Bring your program to life. Take the opportunities where they are. So speak to your organizations. You can put in road shows. You can put in different things. Lots of these things, I think, are being regarded as old-fashioned. Just try them. If you know your demographic, it is surprising how many people will get out of bed to come in to actually hear about themselves and something they can do, a simple thing, supported by you with brilliant pathways to help them get to where they want to go. Their goals need to become your goals if you're going to be really successful. So I think we have heard a lot today about identifying risks and trends. That's fantastic. What makes me really sad is why, since I've started, is that the health of the nation, and I don't hold myself personally responsible, but has not improved. Obesity, just one thing, is getting much worse. So we're not clearly winning. So really think about what you want to go after, because these three simple, simple things can make a really big difference uh, on a wide scale. 
As Chris and other, um, the other speakers this morning were talking about, we really need to look after our mind health as well as our physical health. I have been working long enough to see that mind health didn't even exist before 2010. It was never discussed at health and wellbeing conferences. So it's great that it is now discussed, but don't forget the physical health, because actually they are inextricably linked, and NICE for a very long time, I haven't looked it up just recently, said the first thing you would do for somebody's mental health is increase, include them, encourage them to become more physically active. So they are inextricably linked, and they are often uh, not put back together as often as I'd like to see them to do that. I've talked about taking a, a holistic um, approach to life, life um, stage support. Um, we really need to be very, very clear. Walk the walk, talk the talk. You need to do that. It's no good at saying in an organization that our culture's great if your culture isn't great. Don't say take time for yourself, but actually can you just do this? You've got to look at some of those things. We all know our cultures can be improved. We're not going to be able to do this, that all of it in one go, but just pick it off slowly and try and work out um, what you can do to help to improve that. Data and your demographics is going to be your best friend. Really look at that data, really, really um, interrogate it and uh, make sure that you're, you are using your business objectives to get the company on board with your employees' objectives and interweave them so they can work hand in hand. And then finally, bring your program to life. I really like what um, Bruce uh, was saying this morning about um, uh, how, how we need to talk about the we. I, I, I started my life as a physiotherapist in the NHS, and I was always told by my managers that actually the patients that did best always talked about my nurse, and they always talked about the physiotherapist, because we would go along and do the bit that they didn't really like. I always used to say to the students that I was then lucky enough to work with, if they say my physiotherapist, I think we're starting to win in the world. So I say to you, if you can start to get your employees, instead of saying the wellbeing program, to our wellbeing program, then you've probably got them engaged and starting to go down the right track. So I'll hand back over. We've got a couple of minutes for questions, so I'll hand back to Chris. Great. Thanks. I always remember, actually, the time that we uh, uh, put in physical assessment, just short 15 minutes, know your numbers, access to the EAP went up 40%. So things are not what you design them to be. They are what the employees experience them and want them to be. Um, so, yes, great opportunity to have some questions. Glad we've got a bit of time.